Okay, so open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 7, please, and we're going to read uh, quite a few verses, but it'll be throughout the, uh, throughout the time, so it's not going to be all at one go, but uh, Exodus chapter 7, we're going to start there, and we'll read a few verses there. Okay, so starting at verse 1, oh well, I suppose a bit of background if you remember where we were. Last time we saw Moses at the burning bush uh, atop of Mount Horeb, which is then known as Mount Sinai. We're skipping a few chapters and now we're going to look at the plagues, the ten plagues of Egypt. So Exodus 7, starting at verse 1, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and with mighty acts of judgment, I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. We'll stop there for a second. But just note that last verse five there. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. So over the last uh, couple of times we've met, we've seen what I've been talking about, or well, it's not my words, it's the commentator's words. We've seen these design patterns. You remember we've mentioned them. If you remember, we saw that mother, Moses' mother saw that he was good and it used those words, she saw that he was good. And that echoed the words in Genesis when God looked at creation and he saw that it was good. And then we saw how Moses was placed into the basket, the teva in Hebrew, also known as an ark. And it was covered in pitch. So Moses was in the ark covered in pitch. And this echoed back to the story of Noah who was, a, was in an ark covered and pitched. So you remember these design patterns. And so what we've seen from that is that the writer of Exodus has taken great pains to make these links between Moses and Genesis. Don't forget, given the way the text was written and so how hard it was to write even back then, it's not easy to put footnotes in or cross references to other parts of the book. And Bible verses didn't come around until the 17th century, so it's hard to refer back to other places, and so this is how they did it. They used the repeated words and sentence structure or repeated scenarios to flash at us, saying, this has been done before, go check it out. But what the writer of Exodus wants us to see, and we saw this last time, is that Moses is a new Adam and a new Noah. And Adam and Noah are to do with creation or recreation. Adam was involved in creation the first time round. Noah was involved in a do-over of creation in a sense, a new start. And like I said last time, when we see those, we don't really see it in the English, but in the Hebrew, the reader is expected to think there's going to be another creation happening here. There's going to be another new start happening here. So watch out for it. That's what they're getting sort of led into with the first few chapters of Exodus. Moses' mother saying that uh, she saw that, it was, that he was good. The ark. We're, as a reader, we're expected to see another type of creation or creation do over here. With, uh, with Moses. Now, like I said, we skipped a few chapters because we don't have time to go through everything. Moses has fled Egypt. He met God on top of Mount Horeb. God told him to go to Pharaoh and ask him to 
let his people go. Pharaoh doesn't do this. And then we have the 10 plagues of Egypt. And the 10 plagues of Egypt have a twofold purpose. Maybe there's more, but certainly from what I, from my study of it, there's a twofold purpose in the 10 plagues that you may not necessarily see at a first reading of it. I certainly didn't see it until I studied it. The first purpose is that of de-creation. So what we're going to see in these plagues is that creation is being undone here. This is what the readers to expect. There's going to be some sort of creation here. Well, what we're seeing in the ten plagues is a de-creation. If that's the right word, I don't even think it's a word, but go with it. And secondly, the plagues are a way to assert the preeminence of Yahweh over the Egyptian gods. So let's look at the decreation first. Go to 19, uh, verses 19 and 20 in chapter 7. And it says, The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron to take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams and the canals, over the ponds and all the reservoirs, and they will turn to blood. Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, even in vessels of wood and stone. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials and struck the water of the Nile. And all the water was changed to blood. Okay, so what we don't see here in the English is another glowing blue hyperlink back to Genesis. In the Hebrew, it mentions gatherings of water. You see there, I don't know what your version has, but it says about reservoirs will turn to blood. The Hebrew says gatherings of water, and it's the same word structure as used in Genesis 1 verse 10. So keep your finger in Exodus 7, turn over to Genesis 1, uh, and when I tell you to turn back, keep your finger in Genesis as well, because we're going to be flitting back from Exodus to Genesis here. So Genesis 1 verse 10, have a look at it. Don't forget, now keep in the back of your head, at this plague it's talking about the gathered waters that are going to turn to blood. Exodus 1 verse 10, God called the dry ground land and the, in my version, the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And you can see the gathered word there in the English text. It's the same word used in both. And so, also in the Hebrew, it says, in my English, it says that uh, all the reservoirs and they will turn to blood. And the Hebrew doesn't say that, or doesn't say it like that. What the Hebrew says is this. The Hebrew says, let them be blood. All the canals and the, the rivers and the lakes and the reservoirs, let them be blood. Now, that echoes the command from God in Genesis What did he say in Genesis? Let there be light. Let there be an expanse. Let there be waters. Let them be blood. And so we're starting to see here the link to the creation story with the words that are used in this plague. And then we have the second, third, and fourth plagues, the frogs, the lice, and the flies. Go to, uh, keep your finger in Genesis 1 if if you haven't already. Go to Exodus 8, though. These are the next plagues. Exodus 8, verses 1 to 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord says, Let my people go so they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will send a plague of frogs on your whole country. The Nile will teem with frogs. They will come up into your palace and your bedroom and onto your bed, into your houses of your officials and on your people and into your ovens and kneading troughs. The frogs will come up on you and your people and all your officials. Then over to verse 16 of Exodus 8. The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the ground, and throughout the land of Egypt the dust will become gnats. And then verses 20 to 21, the Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning and confront Pharaoh as he goes to the river and say to him, this is what the Lord says, let my people go so they may worship me. If you do not let my people go, I will send swarms of flies on you and your officials. So what we have here with these plagues is this. In the Hebrew, again, you can see it in the English, it talks about swarming things that swarm, okay? 
And this echoes Genesis 1. Go to chapter 1 of Genesis and verse 20. God says in, in Genesis 1.20, Let the waters teem with living creatures, and let the birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. You see the word team there? That's the same order of words, the swarming things that swarm. So in creation, see, God causes the swarming things that swarm to enter the sea. In creation, he, he creates the sea, and then he says to the, to the creatures, you're going to swarm into the sea. And then in Exodus, in this plague, the swarming things that swarm come out of the sea. You see the difference there? He puts them into the sea of creation. He takes them out of the sea here in this decreation. And with the gnats and the flies, what you have here are flying creatures, winged creatures that are invading the land and dominating the land. And compare this to Genesis 1.22. If you're still in Genesis, verse 22 says this to the... Um, it says, blessed, God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And the Hebrew word for birds there being flying creatures. And the humans were to rule over these. The humans were to have dominion over it. In fact, in verse 28 of Genesis 1, God says, Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky. Rule over every living creature. So humanity is to have dominance over all these things. All these swarming things that swarm in the waters and the flying creatures. But here in Exodus, in the plague, the flying creatures and the stuff that's in the waters are now dominating. They are taking over because the flies are everywhere, the frogs are everywhere, the gnats are everywhere. Can you see the reversal happening here? It's not a full reversal, but it's symbolic. What's happening at creation is unhappening in the plagues. Then we have the fifth plague of pestilence. Exodus 9 verse 2, if you want to turn there. You don't have to. God says, If you refuse to let my people go, the hand of the Lord will bring a terrible plague on your livestock on the field, on your horses and donkeys and camels, and on your cattle, sheep, and goats. And given what we've just seen, you can see that God created the livestock, a creation. And here in the decreation, he's wiping them out. And then we have the boils, which seem a little bit different. Although one of the commentators I used in preparation of this noted that it could be linked to purity. God created humans as perfect people before the fall, but these boils, which make them unclean, reverses that. Then we have the hail and the locusts, Exodus 9, 18. This time tomorrow I will send the worst hailstone that has ever fallen uh, on Egypt from the day it was founded until now. And then the uh, verses 4 and 5 of chapter 10. If you refuse to let them go, I will bring locusts into your country tomorrow. They will cover the face of the ground so it can't be seen. They will devour what little you have left after the hail including every tree that is growing in your fields. Again, God has decreated the livestock, all the animals, wiped out. Created a creation, wiped out here. The trees and the vegetation, they were created at creation. Now look at this plague. They're being wiped out. This is, you see, the decreation happening here. It's reversing the creation of the plants and the trees and the livestock. And then we have the penultimate plague, the plague of darkness that's going to come across the land, a darkness that can be felt. If you look at verse 21 of Exodus 10, stretch out your hand, God says, toward the sky, so that darkness spreads over Egypt, a darkness that can be felt. And perhaps this is the most obvious reversal of creation or decreation, because what were the first words God said in Genesis 1? Let there be light. And now we've darkness. And then the last plague, the killing of the firstborn son, quite an obvious decreation. Now we know what we're looking for. Because the pinnacle of creation is the creation of human beings, life, people made in the image of God. And now with the last plague, we have decreation of life, which is death. So if you put it all together, 
You can see the parallels of Moses with Adam and Noah developing, can't you? We have another event in the start of the Bible where everything is being reset for God's people. This is a third chance. We're getting a new start again with Moses. And to mark the start of the new creation, we have a very famous event that you mightn't have thought of as the start of a new creation, but it comes right after the plagues. And it's in the Red Sea. God tells Moses when he gets to the Red Sea and the Egyptians are coming towards him and they don't know where to go, he says to Moses, raise your staff, stretch out your hand over the the sea to divide the water. And then they go through on dry ground. And let me just read this out to you. You don't have to turn to it. Exodus 14, 22, 21, 22. It says, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided. And the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and a wall of water on their left. Now, contrast this with Genesis 1. Verses 9 to 10, God says, Let the water under the sky be gathered into one place. And it was so. And God called the dry ground land. And the gathered waters he called seas. You see the design pattern again. At the Red Sea, you see we have the waters being separated from the land. Like at the start of creation, the waters were separated. Here we have decreation has all happened. We're back to sort of square one. We have the waters here. And if you think of Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2, the waters there. It talks about the Spirit hovering over the waters. So we have Moses coming to the waters and God separates the waters like he did at creation for them to walk through the waters into this new start, a new creation for them with their new redeemer, Moses. But this new start needs a new covenant. And that happens whenever they go to, back to the mountain of the Lord, Mount Sinai, and we'll look at that next time. So you can see what's going on there in the design pattern. But I mentioned that the plagues have a twofold effect. The second is this. God sent the plagues for a reason. Please do turn to this passage, Exodus 9, 14 to 16. It says this. God says, I will send the full force of my plagues against you and against your officials and your people, so you may know there is no one like me in all the earth. For by now I could have stretched my hand out and struck you and your people with a plague that would wipe you off the earth. But I have raised you up for this very purpose. What's his purpose? Look at the words. That I might show my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. These plagues are to show his power. And Yahweh showed his power with these plagues because with each plague, Yahweh was showing that he has power. Power over the Egyptian gods. You see, you probably know that Egypt had a load of different gods that they worshipped. And one of the reasons these books were written was to show without a shadow of a doubt that Yahweh is the one and only God. There's no other. And when the Israelites, if you think about them, they've lived in Egypt for 400 years. All they have known is the Egyptian culture and the Egyptian gods. All they've seen everywhere are all these different gods in Egypt. They would have heard about Yahweh from their ancestors, taught about him, but all they knew was the Egyptian culture as well. It's all intermingled into that. And this is perhaps why the first two commandments of the ten are have no other gods and don't be carving anything or making an image of a god and bowing down to it because this is what they were steeped in in Egypt as slaves. But in these plagues, Yahweh asserts his authority over all these things that the Egyptians worshipped. And he was showing his people that these Egyptian gods are nothing. I am God and God alone and I have power over these things. So listen to this, because here are some of the Egyptian gods. We have Hapi, 
Not sure if it's pronounced that way. The God of the Nile. We have Hecate, the God of fertility. Geb, the God of the earth. Kepri, God of creation. Hathor, Goddess of love. Isis, the Goddess of medicine. Nut, the Goddess of the sky. Seth, the God of storms. Ra, the sun God. And Pharaoh, who is the ultimate power in Egypt. And each one of these gods is destroyed by Yahweh in each one of these plagues. For example, the god of the Nile, Happy, is rendered useless when the Nile is turned to blood. Where's Happy now? Why can't Happy stop the Nile turning to blood? He's the god of the Nile. Why can't he stop it happening? Because he doesn't exist. What about Hecate, the god of fertility? Well, the image of Hecate the people worshipped was a frog. And yet the frogs plague the country. You have Capri, the god of creation, which has a fly as his head. Out come the flies. Isis, the god of medicine. Out come the boils. Not the goddess of the sky. Down comes the hail, and so on and so on. With every single one of these gods, Yahweh is saying, uh-uh. I am God. And I have power over these things. And then we have the last two big ones. The second most worshipped god in Egypt was Ra, the god of the sun. And the penultimate plague is darkness. And then we have the ultimate god in Egypt, Pharaoh himself, who is considered the son of Ra. Pharaoh's father was taken out when the darkness came. And then in the last plague, Pharaoh's very own son is taken out. And Pharaoh can't stop it because he isn't a God. So while we have a decreation and a recreation here, we have a reminder that Yahweh is the one and only God, and there is no other. And he has power and authority over all things. And so the Israelites have had a massive display of God's power. God manifested himself to them so blatantly. But since history repeats itself, you'll see how quickly they forget and turn away from Yahweh time and time again. And that's our sinful nature. And so humanity needs a redeemer that is better than Moses. I wonder who that could be.